All right, so good afternoon again, everybody. Uh, we are very happy to have with us uh, Leonardo Rastelli from Stony Brook, who will tell us about carving out the space of gravitational EFTs. Leonardo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to speak in quote unquote Paris. It's not quite the same thing as being in Paris, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to give this talk. So I will give a um, bit of an overview. So it would not be, this is a very technical subject. I will try to be more conceptual, uh, at least at the beginning. Um, I will um, review a few of uh, a few recent papers that um, I wrote with a wonderful group of collaborators, citation will come later, but also other people's work, because this is a subject where many people uh, are working. And in particular, there were two very nice papers that appeared yesterday uh, that have a significant overlap with the subject of this talk. So I tried my best to incorporate some of the insights in, into this slide, but uh, you know, you will forgive me, the papers really are very recent. So, um, so let me start with some very, um, general questions. So what is quantum gravity and what are some of the questions we would like to answer? Um, a basic one in the absence of, uh, of a collider we can build that will directly probe the, the, quants, uh, the Planck scale uh, is, the, is the notorious dichotomy between the landscape and the swamp land. Um, we know we have gravity in the real world, so which for the purpose of this talk will be defined as a spin to uh, massless particle, and we would like to know. And so on very general grounds, we can write down an effective field theory, such as Einstein general relativity plus higher derivative corrections and the standard model and all sorts of other light fields that we observe in the world, and we would like to know uh, well, does anything go? Can is is effective field theory uh, the end uh, of theoretical physics, or is that some more basic principle that restrict the space of healthy effective field theories uh, in this, in where health is defined by the statement that they can actually be incorporated in a truly uh, quantum UV complete theory? And so we call the Swampland, the space of putative effective field theories with arbitrary matter content and parameters uh, that are not necessarily embeddable in a UV theory, and the landscape is the dry land that can be. Um, one can, of course, uh, make the, 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 uh, these questions more precise, and these are sort of order in, in uh, increasing um, um, specificity. Uh, and so one famous question is, is a string theorist you like to answer. Uh, we have many indications that um, the string theory is the only game in town as perturbative quantum gravity goes. So famously string theory, at least perturbatively, is, is a fully well-defined weakly coupled theory of gravity that contains, of course, additional, an additional infinite power of higher spin uh, at, at, the, at the string scale. Uh, and is this, the truly, can we actually establish that that every weak couple theory of, of gravity is a string theory? And more, um, there are certain urgent questions that I think some a segment of, of uh, people in the audience will appreciate that are very important. Uh, there's some controversy in the in the string phenology community whether certain detailed constructions um, of in string theory are. Um, fully consistent. And this is nobody's fault. In theory, it's complicated. There are many moving parts. Sometimes, by necessity, you need to make, you're in the corner of parameter space where uh, there isn't really a, a very systematic way to approximate uh, your equations. And so the notorious question, for example, whether uh, whether in string theory there are uh, supersymmetric KDS vacuum with the, uh, where the internal, uh, say, for example, ADS4 vacuum where the internal uh, six-dimensional manifold is is parametrically small, uh, or the question whether there are any non-supersymmetric ADS vacuum at all in string theory are questions that are still um, hard to address from from uh, from the top down in string theory. And so, having a different perspective, like the one I'm advocating in this talk, which is a one based on general principles, is of course useful. And and what is the general philosophy here? 
The general philosophy is the one um, that goes under the general moniker of the bootstrap program. So you want to study um, quantum gravity with fixed asymptotic boundary conditions. And here I'm just setting the, the three cases of negative zero and positive cosmological constant. Um, focusing not so much on a detailed microscopic model, but on um, general principles. So you identify observables and you constrain them by uh, the axiom that's supposed to obey. So this is, of course, particularly clean in the case of negative cosmological constant, where by definition, quantum gravity in asymptotic and the space is conformal field theory on the boundary. And we understand the axioms of conformal field theory perfectly well. Um, somewhat more tentative is the story of asymptotic flat space. We do have a perfectly well-defined observable, which is uh, the S matrix. So in the case of gravity, you have to be a little careful. There are infrared divergences in, in, in low dimension. So if you, if you want to be on safe grounds, you want to take the dimension of space time. So here in this case, perhaps I can start saying this. Here in this case, we would assume from the get go, well, this is a bit too small, that for example, in space time dimension greater than four, there's a perfectly well defined um, exclusive as methods for scattering of gravitons. In four dimension, you have to struggle a little bit more and define some suitable infrared safe observable, but the, the general principle is clear. The estimate is a well-defined observable, and it should, obey, it should obey a certain set of rules, which are a little bit less obvious than the one of, of, of the conformal booster, but nevertheless, under plausible physical assumption, we can, we can carry on this program. And finally, and really I, have, I will have uh, truly nothing uh, intelligent to say today, uh, of course, it would be of great interest both formally and phenomenologically to study the case of positive cosmological constant. And so there's a sense in which this way of thinking about the problem, this booster philosophy of constraining observables subject to certain general principles is both safe because we are not making any uh, detailed dynamical assumption uh, and also kind of conservative. It's, it would seem, at least superficially, the inclusion of gravity, at least for, for the cosmological constant, is certainly the cosmological constant is negative. Then inclusion of, of gravity is completely straightforward. The, the bulk graviton is dual to a, to a, a boundary stress tensor, and we are in the, the standard form of field theory. And even in the case of flat space, we are just adding a spin to massless particle to the mix. It doesn't really seem to be such a big deal. And so we can then hope that um that this uh, this is we can at least try to learn as much as we can from uh from this general conservative approach of of, of just imposing general principles okay so uh, why is this actually um useful you could say well general principles are general so what what can you ever hope to learn just by the tools of effective field theory? Is an effective field theory just a way to parameterize our ignorance about the UV and so anything goes? Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, so the framework is indeed the one where we parameterize um, what we don't know by an infinite tower of higher derivative uh, interaction. So just to, um, to be concrete, and this is a toy model that I will uh, use repeatedly in this talk, uh, we can focus on, on a simple theory that contains a single uh, light scalar, which for simplicity here I'm taking to be massless. And I'm parameterizing the, the theory of this light scalar uh, by an on-shell process. This is both technically more convenient and conceptually preferable than, than, than writing down an off-shell Lagrangian. And I'm focusing here on the, process, on, on the um, connected Two two point two two two. So this is two 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 scattering. In um, so this is just the amplitude for two 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 scattering. As the bit here, and we can write down um, uh, this amplitude as a function of minus some invariance. And here, for simplicity, I'm taking the most general amplitude one can write down at three level. So there's a bunch of um, 
term which are sort of obviously coming from the self-interaction of the scalar with itself. And then there's an infinite tower of higher derivative corrections that will be quartic couplings uh, with, uh, which are more and more irrelevant. And so these um, coefficients here are a priori a infinite set of undetermined parameters that would appear to just parameterize our indurance about the UV complete theory of which this is a low energy approximation. But in fact, it has long been appreciated, and this is something that certainly was already known more or less implicitly in, in the 60s and 70s in the context of chiral Lagrangians and pion physics, that uh, these seemingly arbitrary uh, so-called Wilson coefficients actually need to obey certain inequalities if they are to arise as a, as a truly healthy theory uh, that comes from a UV complete uh, quantum field theory. And this program of um, constraining these Wilson coefficients uh, using the, all the constraints that come from the general principle of causality and unitarity and of course Lorentz invariance have been systematized recently. So there was a famous paper from 2006 that sort of reminded us of these inequalities and, and also gave a, a variety of some classical argument where you can see these inequalities in a, in a very physical way. Uh, and then in, in the last couple of years, these, the complete set of inequalities that follow from Tutu scattering have been systematized. And so the kind of, uh, the kind of result you're going to obtain from this program, which I, will, which I will review in this talk, is a carving out of this parameter space of Wilson coefficients. Only if these particular ratios of Wilson coefficient here, this is some notation I haven't introduced yet, lie in this uh, island, then the theory is healthy. Anything that lies outside is unhealthy. And so you will recognize the, kind of, the type of carving out which has become um, very familiar from, from the conformal bootstrap. There is a set of parameters that are a priori arbitrary, but in fact, the bootstrap constraints uh, force them to lie in certain in certain regions. By the way, I mean, it goes without saying that you should interrupt me with questions. I'm starting in a, in a very pedagogic way because I was told that I should do so, but um, please. Now, of course, um, you could ask the not entirely sociological question of why, uh, why we are doing this now. Isn't this um, completely uh, understood and, and very old? Of course, the connection between causality and electricity goes back to optics and kramitz kenning and the asthmatics booster was, of course, uh, uh, very hot in the 60s when people were dreaming of deriving the ultimate theory of the strong interactions by imposing these, these general principles. That program in its original incarnation failed, but it, it led to good things such as string theory by the Veneziano amplitude. And uh, in recent years, this program has been, has been um, uh, rekindled by a, a couple of, by, by a few um, um, discoveries. One, um, I don't know if I want to say discovery, but uh, perhaps change of emphasis. One is, is this sort of more modern idea that rather than, than, than being too ambitious and trying to nail, say, for example, the theory of the strong interaction for first principle, or even worse, the theory of quantum gravity from first principles, you should take a step back and, and take this uh, more agnostic viewpoint where you have a putative landscape of, the, well, you, have, you parameterize the possibilities and you ask yourself, uh, you play an exclusion game, a carving out game. And Critics was very much inspired by the conformal Bruce, where famously, not only the, the story is surprisingly powerful and axioms lead to a vast reduction in this uh, parameter space, but somewhat serendipitously, you discovered that, for example, the 3D Ising model lies at a very special point, at the kink of this uh, exclusion region. So, of course, we would like to do something similar. Uh, for for more general effective field theories and in particular for quantum gravity. And so, um, and also of course these days everybody has mathematics running on their laptop, so you don't you don't need to be a very sophisticated computational physicist uh, to play this kind of games. And and we are we are very happy to dirty our hands and do some numerical work. Perhaps people in the sixties were uh, too um, stuck up on finding you know writing down the ratio of gamma function describes QCD. That's 
it would be wonderful if it work, but probably life is harder. So, so if we want to ever hope to get a, such a nice story as an interesting physical theory lying at, at the kink, clearly we must go beyond general uh, parametric scaling. Uh, and we need to be very precise about the kind of bounds. Ideally, we'll find sharp bounds, but if, even if they're not sharp, at least they better be precise in the sense that we should really need to be precise about the numerical coefficients. And so that is what will be the target of this talk, in particular for the case where we have gravity. Okay, so let's go back to the scalar model again. So here I'm just writing the most general three level um, amplitude to, to uh, um, connected amplitude. There are again this uh, self interaction of the scalar. And then these higher derivative coupling, you see four derivatives, six derivatives, eight derivatives are captured by this infinite CS expansion, which on, on course on very general ground, just by imposing crossing and the fact that. The Mandelson variable add up to zero has to take uh, this this generic form, and just a, a small um, a small a small reminder about our notation. Uh, of course, the Mandelson invariant S, as everybody would like, is the center of mass of energy squared, and I'm going to use U uh, to indicate momentum transfer. So, in particular, the forward scattering, which is t equal to zero, would correspond to equal to zero. This is perhaps slightly non-standard. In some of the literature, momentum transfer will be indicated by Mandelbus, Mandelbus t, but that's just a renaming. Just keep in mind, because you may be puzzled why I, I, I'm using u and s rather than s and t, but u is for us momentum transfer. So, um, so that was the simplest model you can conceive, but of course, our target is to couple this to gravity which we're going to do by still considering external scalars because that simplifies our life. We don't have to deal with the polarization of external gravitons, but we include dynamical gravity by uh, allowing it to propagate in the middle. For example, at three level, this is the contribution of the graviton propagator in the three different STU channels. And I already mentioned the fact that, uh, strictly speaking, we need to work in the match greater than four to, to avoid IR diverging forms of gravitons, otherwise the, in, the Including amplitude is strictly zero uh, if you include massless gravitons. And the crucial assumption that we'll make throughout, which I need to be a little careful about, is that the effective field theory is weakly coupled. So, what we have in mind is a one parameter family of models parameterized by a positive number epsilon, which is very small. And, and that controls all effective field theory couplings. So that means that the effective field theory is weakly coupled all the way up to the up to the cutoff. So so I didn't I didn't mention this, but perhaps I should emphasize. So in this talk, the letter big M will always indicate the cutoff of the effective field theory. So above big M. In principle, anything goes. You can have arbitrarily uh, massive, say, with arbitrary interactions. And below big M, we are assuming we know the degrees of freedom. In this particular case, in simple case, we have a, a massless scalar and a massless graviton. And we parameterize the effective field theory by writing down the most general amplitude that involves this light degrees of freedom. Of course, the UV cutoff is a sliding cutoff, as always in the framework of quantum field theory and effective field theory. But once we, we fix the cutoff, um, we have this effective field theory description. We're assuming that the effective field theory description is, is, is valid up to the cutoff and is weakly coupled. So to give a famous example of, of, such, a, of such a situation is string theory. So you fix the string coupling, this string once and for all. It's a small number, 10 to the minus nine, for example. And then that gives you a hierarchy of scale between the string scale, which is our cutoff, and the Planck scale. And so clearly, 
this model is weakly coupled all up to the sink scale, in fact, quite a bit beyond. But eventually, if you go to arbitrarily high energy, in particular, as you approach the Planck energy, the model will become strongly coupled. So we are not assuming that the whole theory is weakly coupled. We're just assuming that the effective field theory description is weakly coupled up to the cutoff. I hope this assumption. Uh, sorry, Leonardo, let me ask a clarifying question. The various yes. couplings you have here have dimensions. So if yes, you want to make I'm a I'm coming to that in a minute. Yes, the various couplings certainly have dimensions. So what we when will you say they are small, small compared to what scale? So first of all, they're all proportional to epsilon. Okay, so epsilon is a dimensionless coupling. For example, in string theory, that would be just string. All the effective, for example, think about the to, to, to reorient yourself, think about this as the effective field theory regarding string theory for I don't know. The, the dilaton. Okay, assume that string theory is weakly coupled, then the dilaton will have a bunch of higher derivative couplings. They all, they all scale with the string coupling. Right, but in that case, it's the string scale that sets what we call small, right? There are two notions of, okay. First of all, yes, the, the, the couplings are, are dimensionful, and we're gonna make them dimensionless by introducing power to the cutoff. Ah, okay. That makes sense, and that's what I want. Once okay. these dimensionless coupling are still small in the sense that they scale with the power of epsilon. Okay. So, okay. Fine. Hi, Leonardo. So, I also have a question. Can I ask? Yes. Could yes. you could you apply your analysis somehow directly in the limit epsilon equals zero? Just you know, for example, take just Venetian amplitude. Well, if epsilon is strictly to zero, of course. Everything is then you just have disconnect, then you just have the disconnected amplitude. So yeah, epsilon, but for example, could you each, ask you know this? each of these vertices goes like epsilon? That this would go like maybe epsilon square. Well, right? I, I don't know if it goes like that, but I know that three-level Venetian amplitude exists. It was on your first slide that you want to figure out. Yeah, so in, in my notation, the three-level Venetian amplitude is, is proportional to, to epsilon square or epsilon, whatever. So let's take this factor out and could you could you just analyze that thing and and then you don't have to make any excuses. Well, in practice, that's what we're going to do, because epsilon will factorize out of everything, right? We, we, we okay. will only be able to there's a certain homogeneity to the problem. So, okay. so the the we will only be able to to put constraints on ratios of couplings where epsilon factors out. But it's important to know that you are in a framework where 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 you have with coupling uh, up to this up to this cutoff end. So, um, yeah, and so as has as been already uh, anticipated by a few of you, two things are, are clear. First of all, we need to work with dimensionless quantities. And so we, we plug in suitable powers of the cutoff M so that we get something dimensionless. And moreover, given our assumption we're working for a very small epsilon, we will, and there will be a certain homogeneity to the problem, we will only be able to bound ratios of couplings. Leonardo? So, yes. Um, there's an implicit assumption, I suppose, which is that you have two scales. You can imagine a theory with more. Is there an interesting extension or question to be asked about a theory like that? You mean more than one, more, in other terms, there's more than one dimensionless coupling epsilon. There's epsilon one, epsilon two, et cetera. Yeah. You, you could, in, for simplicity, we're assuming that all, these, all the carbon that you have go to zero with the same power of epsilon. You could imagine a, a situation where see frozen just for me. No, it's frozen for me as well. I see it is moving so huh. well I don't know what situation to imagine then. Is he aware that he's frozen? Probably right. not. Yeah. Um, Leonardo, can you hear us? I think it it, um, it broke down, so he will reconnect. That's what happens when you ask a question. <laughs> Uh, Leonardo, can you hear us now? Yes. 
Yes, I think I got disconnected for a minute. Yes, we lost okay. you at some point. Yeah. Okay, yes. Anyway, I was just trying to, I was trying to emphasize that the amplitude road was a three level amplitude. And the reason that is justified is because I'm assuming that the effective field theory is weak up all the way up to the cutoff. Of course, in principle, there will be correction to the effective, to the effective field theory, should include effective field theory loops, but they will go with higher powers of epsilon. So there, there's, a, in principle, a systematic game that you can, you can play of correcting these results at higher powers of epsilon. But I will not do this in this talk. So to play this general booster game, we need to make assumptions about M. And some of them are more um, obvious than the other. One that is, I would say, rather uncontroversial is the fact that you should have a positive partial weight decomposition. So here, for simplicity, I'm looking at the discontinuity of the amplitude. Always, you should approach the amplitude from above. In the, so this is the complex X plane for fixed physical values of the uh, of the uh, of U of the momentum transfer U, which is negative, and so on the physical uh, region of positive S, uh, you will have a standard uh, partial weight decomposition, which here, here I'm, for the piece I'm writing for the imaginary part of the amplitude. So this is just really using um, Lorentz symmetry or, or rotational symmetry to, to decompose these into uh, eigenfunctions of, uh, of the rotation group. And there is an uh, a priori unknown um, density here, which is uh, contains all the dynamical information, and we'll be completely agnostic about about this object. Either then it obeys constraints that come from unitarity, and unitarity really give you a two sided bound. There's the one that we will using is just the fact that it is positive. A priori unitarity also imposes an upper bound, but remember that our assumption is that all these interactions are very small. So rho itself is really proportional to epsilon. And so you're never probing the upper bound. Another rather obvious assumption of analyticity and crossing symmetry already starts to get rather subtle. It has not been established in even for scattering in the absence of a mass gap. And so this is here one of the cases where, where physical intuition and, and, and rigorous uh, axiomatic QFT are in a bit of a tension. But if, if I cannot assume crossing symmetry, I have nothing to tell you. So I'm going to assume crossing symmetry, even in the presence of dynamical graph. And we're also going to assume that at least far enough away in the first sheet in the complex S plane, remember, again, I mean, let me mention this again. We are working in the physical region where U is uh, well, above the cutoff, but smaller than zero. Uh, we have uh, analyticity of the amplitude. And the perhaps more subtle assumption that, however, I will have to discuss this in two steps. Uh, is the one of regular boundedness. So in this limit in which we take large S uh, along any ray in the complex S plane for fix U. So that is the regular limit of high energy and, uh, and small angle. The amplitude should decay sufficiently fast. In fact, if you divide by two parts of S, you should go to zero. That means that if you take M over S squared, you can write down a dispersion relation. And so the, the number of powers of S in the denominator is known as the number of subtractions. And so the slogan is that two subtractions suffice. Note that this is true, for example, in string theory, because the graviton comes accompanied by an infinite power of higher spin particle, the resum, famously, the linear edge trajectory of, the, uh, of string theory resums to something which is a little bit softer than the, than the behavior of, of the graviton. Propagator guys might grow like S square, but there's a correction here, which is a little bit negative for negative U. Now, in fact, and this is a point that, I mean, I've known for a few months because uh, our friends told us, but has been uh, nicely emphasized in the paper that appeared yesterday by uh, Karan Yot, Simons Duffons, and, and, and others. Uh, we will, in fact, need a weaker assumption. So if you're worried that this is too strong, uh, I will uh, actually explain later that it's actually not strictly needed. Something weaker is enough. But I will 
for, for now use this stronger assumption, both for historical reasons and also for pedagogical reasons, because it makes the discussion a little bit easier. Okay, so I've already mentioned this, even in ordinary quantum field theory, this problem only, this problem is only partially established, even crossing symmetry in the absence of a mass gap is not proven. Uh, the analyticity properties are also clearly very subtle. And so here we are in a framework where we think there's a reasonable physical assumption, but if you don't believe them, then well, you can decouple from this talk. I have to start somewhere, and this is my axiomatic framework for the S matrix containing gravity. As I will uh, proceed to the second uh, part of the talk, or perhaps the last one, third part of the talk, where we will uh, do, we will repeat this uh, in a in asymptotic ADS, we will we'll be on much firmer footing because there we can just use the, the actions of safety, which I would say are completely uncontroversial. And we can now use complex analysis. The, the, the complex explanation is wonderful because uh, it lets us connect these low energy parameters that we don't know with high energy physics. We also don't know the high energy physics, but what we do know is that it comes with a definite sign. And so the basic idea here, we're going to draw this contour in the, uh, in the complex S plane by assumption of analyticity. The, so I'm, we are going to integrate M over, well, we're gonna write the dispersion relation for M over S squared. Let me not write it explicitly, but this has to vanish because of our assumption of analyticity. If I do this contour, Moreover, the arc at infinity contributes zero because by, by, from our assumption of Reggie boundedness. And so what, what this does is we get to relate the integral over this low energy arc, which we'll be able to express in terms of the low energy parameters to the discontinuity across the cuts that correspond to the high energy region. Okay, so, and so, this kind of contour argument then gives us a direct connection between the low energy parameters that we want to bound and the high energy physics that we don't know about except that it comes with a definite sign. And that's the beginning of a program to bound the low energy parameters. And here I was indicating with this uh, red card the fact that in principle I should include low energy effective field theory loops, but I'm, I'm not going to because I'm a very weak coupling. And so we're working the approximation where the effectivity is at the three level. And we can now play this game. This, is, this game is, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that I should, I should uh, um, give credit to. Um, I've flashed a few names here. Um, many of these formalisms are, are closely related to, to one another. I will follow the formalism of Karoni, Watt, and Duong because first of all, I think it's the most transparent and second, because it's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, and so as advertised, we, com we construct a certain subtracted amplitude. So K here is a even integer from two to four and up. So you see that it's more and more subtracted, but K equal to two is already safe because we are divided by two powers. And so by the analytic assumption that I had earlier, this has to be zero. And so we split the contour then in these two parts. So the, the arc at infinity vanishes by our regular behavior assumption. And then we, we split the contribution and the contribution that comes from the cut, that's the high energy part, which should be the right hand side, and the contribution that comes from this uh, arc. And the contribution that comes from the arc in our simple setup where the effective field theory is just some relative function can just be obtained by, by the rest view theorem we, we had parameterized the, the amplitude in terms of these unknown couplings and in terms of the graviton propagator, that's the low energy part. The high energy part, we can write very explicitly in terms of some, well, again, somewhat explicitly. This density is unknown. We know nothing about it except that it's positive. And then here for simplicity, I didn't want to crowd the slides very much, but there are certain very explicit functions of uh, J and M squared that come in. Okay, so let me try to say this again. We fix 
u once and for all. u is a, is a parameter that enters in this sum rules. And we fix k, which is the number of subtractions. The integral, so the high energy part is treated by inserting the partial wave expansion. So the, the integral of S prime here is what becomes here an integral of our little m from the cutoff to infinity. That's the high energy cut. I'm integrating from m to infinity. And then, of course, the partial wave expansion comes with the sum over spin. So both j and little m are summed over. And there's a certain density that I know nothing about. And then in a very explicit expression that just comes from, from you know, treating this simple uh, analytic function and, and looking at the contour. So we, you see, we get an infinite set of sum roots, an infinite in two senses. First of all, because we can take arbitrarily even k. And second, because for each value of k, we have u to play with. So this sum rule has to be obeyed for every value of u. And you see that the left hand side, for simple uh, complex analysis reasons, only gets contribution from the effective field theory coupling that grow uh, at least as. OS to the K in the regular limit. So for example, you see that the graviton, which has spin two growth, it grows like S squared in the regular limit, only contribute to the first sum rule, the one has K equal to two. It turns out that this, since we, we, we broke the, sim the crossing symmetry between S and U by writing a fixed U dispersion relation, um, there are secret relations uh that um that you do not quite see immediately so you the point is that there are multiple ways you, you, in which you can express the same energy coupling in terms of these high energy sum rules and those are known as null constraints in other terms low energy crossing symmetry imposes certain constraints just among the heavy data this is not very surprising the heavy data are essentially given by light light heavy three-point couplings and so the fact that low energy cost and symmetry would impose constraints among them is not surprising. And this is an example of such a constraint. And you can see that um, the relevant dimensional combination here is, is the product of J over little m, which we can re-express. So if you think about it, J over little m, m is the exchange energy. So classically, that would be the input parameter of the process. If you have two particles scattering at angular momentum m and energy little m, angular momentum general little m, then the combination B is j over little m. And so the, the, the relevant dimensions combination is the impact parameter times the cutoff. OK, so the very good news about this is that this approach we can now Clearly, so now the idea is that given that we have definite signs on the right hand side because so is positive, this is very much in the framework that many of you are familiar with. is is the standard framework where where we can we can constrain the energy coupling using uh, using semi definite methods. The simplest way to to do this is to expand this in a Taylor expansion in the forward limit. The forward limit, remember, is u going to zero. And this was, was was done for several of the past years. And um, of course, if you are going to expand, uh, if, you're, if you're going to milk the sum rules by expanding the forward limit, you have some issue with, with the graviton pole. So the simplest thing to do, which was done first, of course, is to work in the case without gravity. And then many people over the last decade or so wrote down uh, consequences of expanding these sum rules in the foreign limit. It already, you learn a very important lesson that these you can find compact islands for these dimensionless combinations, which are first of all made dimensionless by introducing power of the cutoff, and then they're ratios because we want to get rid of this epsilon. And so, the upshot, which is a very nice slogan, is that they. Standard effective field theory scaling. I mean, the, the fact that this coupling should shut off as m goes to infinity is exactly what you expect from effective field theory. The, the, the fact that, that the, the, this irrelevant, the couplings of this irrelevant interaction should be suppressed by parts of the cutoff times a numerical coefficient, which, however, is bounded in a compact region. 
And so you, you recover effective field theory scaling just from this very general principles of unitarity and causality. Uh, sorry, Leonardo, but the ratios you're talking about don't, they depend on the cutoff, but not on the Planck scale. Absolutely. So there is no constraint that involves the Planck sorry, scale? Sorry, up to now, up to now, sorry, this slide is without gravity, right? Ah, okay, sorry. Now we introduce gravity. And then you have a, the, 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 the first in simple technical hurdle you have to overcome is the fact that now you cannot expand this in the forward limit. But there's a simple fix. Who told you you had to expand the forward limit in the first place? This is an exact sum rule. So the way to milk it is the way we, we always deal in the bootstrap. So convoluted, apply some interesting function on it. And for example, a function could be just convolute this with some interesting function of u that extracts the relevant physics. That is a little dangerous because what you like to do is now convolute this with some function psi of u and integrate between minus m square and zero in del u. But you may be worried that as u approaches minus, uh, minus m squared, you are really probing the, the, this, this low energy effective field theory expansion is going, is going to be problematic because you are really at, at the cutoff of the effective field theory. And you may be worried that this infinite sum gives you divergent. The first simple fix is just take linear combination of this infinite set of sum rules so that these infinite uh, series truncates. And so we are going to write down an improved version of the sum rule where this is an explicit function we can compute, where only the first three effective field theory couplings, for example, contribute. And now we're on perfectly safe ground in convoluting this with some function of u. And of course, the, the name of the game will be to choose a suitable function of u that puts interesting bounds on these coefficients. And this is something you optimize on a computer. And the computer, the optimal functional is something that looks a little bit like a step function of this kind in parameter space. And so what, what effectively this convolution is doing is Fourier transforming from, from momentum space to parameter space. And physically, this means that we are actually going to be measuring couplings, not in the foreign limit, which is small u, but rather at fixed and input parameter of the order of one of the cutoff. And that trick is sufficient to now be able to derive bounds that also involve dimensional ratios involving the Newton's constant. And so this is a, an example that came from our uh, paper a, a little over, over a year ago. It's just, it's just a statement of, it's just a um, really proof of concept. You get different bounds in different dimensions. Here I'm taking greater than four for reasons I already mentioned. It's just a proof of concept. There's nothing deep about this plot, but you, now you can get plot that involves the Newton's constant. And you see that you will recall from the original paper by, by Arkani Hamed et al. that in their story, G2, which is the leading higher derivative correction, had to be positive. And now the moment you add gravity, then that is allowed to be a little bit negative. The reason is that the graviton uh, exchange provides a bit of a, of a time delay that can compensate for the violation of causality that comes from a slightly negative G2. So it's interesting of course, to do this, not for the same simple scalar model, but with external gravitons. And this is what has been accomplished in the papers that came out yesterday. A shortcut, which we did in our paper, is to supersymmetrize the model. Then if you supersymmetrize the model, then the graviton sits in a super multiple that contains a scalar. And you can effectively study super graviton scattering by studying an analog or a, a scalar amplitudes that in particular, we'll have improved ratio behavior. So now the ratio behavior is, is extremely soft. And we found, for example, in 10 dimensions, uh, this very nice upper bound on G0. G0 is the coefficient in front of Riemann to the fourth. You know, famously in string theory, uh, because of supersymmetry, the leading correction to the einstein hilbert action is R to the fourth. And so this G0 in string theory is something which, of course, is uh, controlled by alpha prime. And so the uh, so in, if you make it dimensionless by putting powers of alpha prime or, or equivalent powers of, of, of little m, then you find this 
very nice band, which appears to be exactly three, which of course is saturated in, let's say in type two string theory where it's 2.4. So this is the kind of thing that could now be made systematic. This is just, a, of course, a particular necessary condition. And one would like to, to turn this into a program in which you could perhaps hope by adding more and more condition to actually saturate the bound. And that would give the first indication, of course, that something like uh, a maximally supersymmetric gravity theory necessarily has to be string theory. That would be very nice. Now, if I may, may ask, yes, uh, capital M in that case is the mass of the first massive state in string theory? Or? Yes. You think? All right. We did not use the upper bound. Of, of this unitarity gain, we only use positivity. If you impose the upper bound, but then of course you're not working with coupling anymore, then you can also de derive an interesting lower bound. But that lower bound is completely realized for us because for us M Planck is much bigger than, than M. So this was done by our friends, where they had and there. Okay, so I'm gonna say something brief about this very nice paper that came out yesterday. So this gentleman, Coronet, Lee Parra Martinez and Simon Zaffin, uh, did the hard work of including uh, external uh, graviton polarization in the mix. So th this is a bound that comes from two to two graviton scattering. And this is the kind of result that they have. So they are working actually in four dimensions, which means that there is action in fried divergence in the game. They don't, they don't worry too much about it. They in, include it in terms of this log divergence. In principle, you could play the game in higher dimension with a little bit more work. And the kind of bounds that you find are, again, compact islands for this dimensional style combination, where in this case, G3 and G4 are specific combination of Riemann cube and Riemann to the fourth. In four dimension, the Riemann square terms is topological, so you don't care. <clears throat> What's extremely interesting about this paper, and I will, if I have time, I will come back to it at the end, is that in this particular case, little m, big M, is defined to be as the mass of the lightest spin four particle. In the previous discussion I had, I was completely agnostic about what big M was, it was just a cutoff of the effective field theory, but here there's a more precise definition. So in their story, they have an arbitrary effective field theory that includes in principle, all sorts of a finite number of spin zero and spin two states. This is what, apart from the masses graviton, they can have spin zero and spin two line matter. And the cutoff is the mass of the first higher spin state. And what's extremely interesting is that by being completely agnostic about what this additional spin zero and spin two state, you still find a compact region for, um, for these couplings. So there's a dramatic consequence that these higher derivative couplings truly are suppressed by the scale of higher spin particles which is a conclusion that was already reached in a more heuristic way with, but with just parametric scaling by in this, fable, in this famous chemist paper. So, so G3 and G4 decay with the mass of the higher spin threshold as a spectrum effective field theory, but now with precise bounds. You see that if you make the stronger assumption that there is no light matter, you only have masses graviton up to the, uh, the scale of the spin four, then of course you find stronger bounds because you're making stronger assumptions. But what is absolutely non-trivial that there are any bounds at all, even if you are allowed for arbitrary uh, light matter states, quote unquote matter state, which is spin zero, spin two. Leonardo? Yes. So, sorry, you probably said this. Can you just say again why you know that M is the mass of a lightest spin four particle? How is this you put in there? It's included because there's a certain sign definiteness of spin zero, spin two versus spin four. So, so the contribution of the spin zero and spin two, come, spin two comes with definite sign. And so they're, they're really able to bound things in terms of the lightest spin four, which is of course, maybe I'm, I'm being a speaker to an audience of one, but this addresses one of your objections. 
So light matter here means low spin then. Yeah. Light matter. So the, the low energy effective field theory contains arbitrary spin zero and spin two. Yeah. Say I find a number to be safe. And then and then the cutoff is set by the higher spin. And the bounds are then are then in terms of the higher spin threshold. Sorry, La, you just mean, as in camps. Do you mean the mass of the lightest spin four particle or the lightest light spin four? Yeah, spin four is because technical reason that we are not sensitive to spin three, but yes, yeah, spin four. So any or any spin bigger than four, I suppose. Well, in principle, it's been bigger than four, yes, but um, yeah. Okay, so let me now go back to this story of energy boundedness. It seemed that we had to make this rather strong assumption. Um, and is it safe? Well, kind of. Okay, so, so here, let me give you a little bit of a physical picture. So I've mentioned this impact parameter a few times. So perhaps I should have defined it earlier. What is impact parameter? Impact parameter definition is just the variable which is fully a conjugate to momentum transfer. So u is minus q squared. Q lies in the d minus two dimensional tender space. And if you re-transform, you find b. So just a change of variables from, from s and u to s and b. And here is a... I'm going to say this in this, this famous, famous in this classical process in which if you have two particles scattering with with a certain impact parameter b, then there's this obvious classical relation between the impact parameter, the angular momentum, and the energy. And this is also true quantum mechanically in the sense that if you prepare wave packets of particles with definite energy, um, you can see that. They will exchange in general, of course, arbitrary inter intermediate state of, of angular momentum J and spin and, and energy E. Uh, but that density is going to be picked at least for a sufficiently high energy. At, at, uh, you can prepare, you know, if you prepare a similar particle with fix with with this with this fixed impact parameter B, then the internal states will be picked when the ratio of J, J and A E is B. And the, trick, the tricky part here is that ratchet boundedness holds for fixed B. And in order to, to derive this relation, you have to Fourier transform back to, mom to, to momentum space, which is, of course, tricky. Uh, nevertheless, you can use the fact that for fixed energy and arbitrarily high and, and, and much higher impact parameter, weak gravity is, is weak. Weak couple, this is noticed in some classic paper long ago. And so leveraging that and doing some clever estimates, you can actually argue that you can control the Fourier transform and in sufficiently high dimension, rather safely in dimension greater than seven. And if you make, if you're willing to make a few still mild, but more dynamical assumptions about what happens at slightly lower energies, for example, if you assume the tidal model, where the, well, if you just do a summary where, where you're resumming the leading contribution with, with the conal phase, then you can push this down to d equal to five. Once you have established this for positive uh, S, which is a physical region, you, you can get to extend this to the complex plane by using, assume it's of exponential growth and um, using standard th um, theorems in, in complex analysis, you can assume that you, you will extend this to the arbitrary complex region. Okay, the good news, which is emphasized by our friends, uh, and you know, they told me a few months ago, but it's, it's nice explaining this recent paper, is that actually you need something weaker. If you are going to derive the dispersion relation by expanding the form limit, yes, you do need this, uh, this assumption of regic growth being softer than S squared. But what we're actually using in this booster method with, with this, uh, with this where we probe the dispersion relation by convoluting it with this, with this function of, of Q uh, is something weaker. So first of all, we are convoluting with a function of Q, which, is, which has compact support in Q. So that means that this kind of an integral, so we're, we're going to define now a smeared amplitude by some kernel psi of Q. And this mean, um, given that in, this integral is compact, this mean amplitude inherits the, the analyticity in S. And so we, we can now directly apply the dispersion argument to this mere amplitude. And it's actually rather easy on, on rather using rather weak assumptions to put a, to put a regibound on this mere amplitude. 
if you choose psi of q judiciously, if you choose it to be a smooth function that vanishes sufficient rapidly at the endpoints, then you can argue that this m of psi will decay rapidly large b, which is a way of saying that the, the conformal partial wave expansion, sorry, the the um the conformal wave expansion, the the um sorry, I'm too much of a conformal person, the partial wave expansion will will shut down at some spin that depends on some fixed pista. And then this immediately gives you an estimate, given that the sum now truncates and the each coefficient of the partial wave expansion is bounded, they, this immediately gives you an estimate that this should not grow faster than linearly. And that's more than sufficient for our purposes. So lo and behold, this smearing method not only is necessary to deal with the graviton pull, but also gives you a shortcut to uh, to a weaker set to where you can just use a weaker set of assumptions than than this one about reg growth. I hope I made this clear. Now numerically, it turns out that by using a, a suitable set of functions, we have this nice property. You just reproduce the same numerical bounds that you found by by the forward expansion. Okay, so in the last fifteen minutes of the talk, sorry, I, I went a little bit slower than I was anticipated. Let me now upgrade to asymptotic ADS. And I can say many of the same words. So what we're interested here in here is, is doing effective field theory in ADS. So in the purest model, we would assume that we just have gravity. So we will write down an Einstein Hilbert action now with a cosmological term and an infinite series expansion with all possible contractions of Riemann tensors. And we're going to make the same with coupling assumptions. Now we have an additional scale, which is the ADS scale. So we're, we're going to assume that our cutoff is, first of all, much larger than the ADS scale, but we're also going to make the assumption that the cutoff is much more than the Planck scale. That's the weak coupling. Of that, that the ratio of, of M over M Planck is, is what I was calling earlier the parameter, just to be clear. What I was calling earlier this parameter epsilon would be the ratio of, uh, of M over M Planck. In conformal field theory language, this would be some power of n. Say in the standard ADS5 case, it would be one over n squared. And, um, and so under these assumptions about the back theory, how does the, the um, boundary theory looks like? Well, in the bulk, we have essentially almost free uh, a bunch of almost free light particles interacting with each other. Well, they're dual to, to a bunch of uh, single trace operators on the CFT side uh, that almost factorize. The assumption that epsilon is small is the assumption that there's large n factorization on the field theory side. And then, and so that, so, so there are really two things that have been said here. First of all, this inequality gives you the fact that you have large n factorization or nearly large n factorization on the field theory side. Whereas this other inequality tells you that the spectrum of single trace states has a gap. So there's a small number of light single trace states and then a large gap in units of uh, the, in, in the bulk, it's in units of ADS, but in the field theory side, it's just a large gap in terms of the dimensionless conformal dimension to the first non-trivial single trace state. And so famously, uh, this gentleman, well, this lady and gentleman, HPPS conjecture that the converse is also true. That if you have a large density with a large single trace gap, and again, here we, again, for an audience of one, namely Eric, we need to be a little bit careful about what we mean by the gap. Ideally, we would take the gap to be the gap to the, to the first higher spin single trace. Uh, these are, in fact, necessary condition to have parametric suppression of these higher derivative couplings in terms of uh, the cutoff. Or to say it in a even simpler slogan, this is necessary, this is sufficient condition to achieve bulk locality, to achieve the fact that, that, that the theory in the bulk is essentially Einstein gravity up to, up to correction, which are very small as the single trace gap is sent to infinity. So of course now we would like to upgrade the Francis game to this ADS game and prove a version of this HPPS conjecture, but with precise numerical bounds. 
Now, again, the good news is that now everything is, is rigorous because we are in the framework of the conformal booster. We can translate this bulk problem into a precise set of expectations for conformal field theory correlators. And there's slightly bad news, which I think by now I have been largely conquered or overcome, is that the standard conformal booster is inadequate for this problem because, because of this large n factorization, UP will be really dominated by double trace states. And those are kind of trivial. So we don't want to do that. So the standard numerical oracle is not very, su very suitable for large n. And, and so we want to develop more analytic type of methods that let us focus on the single trace physics. And so the right tools are what are uh, what we call dispersive sum rules, which are something that uh, is really something rooted in, in causality, in Lorentzian kinematics. And again, for simplicity, I will stick to this scalar model. So we have a, a light scalar coupled to gravity. And in the scalar model, I will, uh, since I'm, I'm, I don't have much time left, but let me, let me just tell you the punchline. I will give you a few of the technical data in the next 10 minutes. Essentially, when the dust settles, we'll be able to repeat in ADS what we did in CFT and, and prove this parametric suppression with precise bounds. In this particular scalar model, the parametric sup suppression will be in terms of some arbitrary UV cutoff M, which really is just a cutoff of the effective field theory. And there's no uh, specific assumption that that should be the highest spin cutoff. But that's just a limitation of this particular scalar model. If one were to take the paper of our friends from two days ago and upgrade to the ADS, which of course is technically challenges because you have to deal with uh, with the uh, sensor correlators, but I don't I don't see any obstacle of that in principle. If you were to do that, then you'd actually truly prove the uh, version of HPPS that Eric likes, which is the one in terms of the higher spin threshold. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so the key, uh, okay, so there are certain technical hurdles and it will be clear then, you know, this is really, I would say the work of my amazing collaborators. So, um, so the, let me give you a, a bit of a, of a flavor of, of the argument. So the key notion here is the notion of double commutator, which is in, in clearly a, a intrinsic Lorentzian notion. So we take the four point function in Lorentzian uh, signature on the vacuum. And we take this um, double commutator type structure where clearly this only makes sense in Lorentzian signature if psi one and psi one and two are, are time like separated, like, like so. And so this particular kinematic configuration is the one that, that has appeared in, in a few crucial places in the last several years. Is, is the one that controls the regge limit, is the one that controls the bounds on cows. In the regge limit, you, you're taking a limit where you boost uh, these particles like so towards the light cone. Um, and so the idea is that this double commutator is the precise CFT analog of the imaginary part of the amplitude in flat space. Okay. There's, there's, a, there's a close parallel that we can exploit to um, to um, to up, up, upgrade the flat space story to ADS. And so much like the amplitude or the subtracted amplitude if you need subtractions, the reconstructed for the imaginary part of M through a dispersion relation. Similarly, the full correlator suitably subtracted is reconstructed from, from the discontinuity. You need it in two different channels, but that's a technicality. And the crucial point that makes this analytic this this program uh, successful is that this double commutator let us focus on single traces. So the double discontinuity of the double traces say in the S channel is zero. Much for the same reason that the imaginary part of a three-level amplitude in in flat space would be zero. And the, the, taking the imaginary part gets you skip one loop order. You relate the imaginary part of the one loop amplitude to the square of the three level couplings and a very similar phenomenon is happening here. And so there's a story that I'm really not gonna go through. You can derive these special relations in many different ways, many different groups arrive at them more or less at the same time. 
so here are some of the relevant references, a particularly uh, nice way to, to use Malian dispersion relations, but uh, this is closely related to the beautiful work of uh, Mazac and Paulos uh, on analytic functionals. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a quick and dirty derivation, which I think is, is uh, rather physical, uh, using light rays. OK, so what's the idea here? We write down the, um, this correlator, and we use the fact that um, we want to we, we consider a kinematic configuration where x1 and x3 are space-like separated. And if that's the case, of course, this has to vanish because of causality. So that's our input. And to get the sharpest bound, we are now going to integrate 1 and 3 along some uh, null ray. Okay, so we, we integrate 1 and 3 along some null ray x plus. So here I'm showing this, this two-dimensional Minkowski space, but keep in mind that 1 and 3 are separated in the transverse direction, which is not shown in the slide. And we do that with some kernel. We want to use the kernel for two reasons. First of all, because if you don't put the kernel, this is not well defined. There are divergences at infinity in, in, in the light rate direct in this in this uh, light rate direction, which needs to be regulated. And moreover, because we want the flexibility to derive a whole family of some rules. We need we need the flexibility of, of playing with the sum rules because those are going to be our sort of physical collider. The, the way we, we are going to set up a collider experiment in some sense, and the different sum rules will correspond to different external kinematics, morally speaking. Okay, so we come. That's an obvious identity, and um, if I could not have the kernel. If, if these amps were well defined in the absence of the kernel, which in fact they are, if you consider suitable um, spinning correlators, then each term will become the disk. And what, what's, what's the reason for it? Because I can replace the external, I can replace the external um, pair by a commutator. And the reason I can replace them with a, with a commutator is that psi of x3 integrated over a null ray annihilates the vacuum. Okay, so null integrated operators kill the vacuum. Using this simple fact, we get to replace, we get, we, 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 we are now starting a double discontinuity. And well, that, now we have to remember that in fact, we do have a kernel and the kernel will introduce additional poles. So it's not gonna be true that we get the, Precise double discontinuity, we got some, we're going to get something involves double discontinuity. And lo and behold, we're going to find a sum rule that is almost a double discontinuity. So it annihilates most of the double traces, except for a few. And so a dispersive functional is a function that has double zeros on all double traces above a certain minimal twist. And the ones below the minimal twist, say the first few ledger trajectories, are not, they don't have double zero, maybe they have simple zero, they have done zero, they have do not have zeros at all. And that comes from the fact that, that there is this curve. Okay, so that's as quick a derivation as I could possibly have. And now we're gonna use the sum rules to milk the relevant physics from the correlator. So first of all, we write the double OP expansion of the scalar correlator, there's the identity. There are double traces. There's this exchange of the stress tensor. And then there's a bunch of composite here, which could be, for example, quartic composite, composite of phi with T and whatnot. And here I've separated the contribution. I've, I've done in CFT this, the same kind of the composition I had in flat space as a heavy part, where heavy is defined by having a twist gap greater than certain minimum. And there's a light part. And as before, the idea will be that the light part will be parameterized in terms of our effective field theory coefficients. And the heavy part, we're going to be agnostic, except that it comes with definite sign. And the analog of the contour deformation argument I had earlier in the complex S plane is now the dispersive function. We apply a dispersive functional to this equation and we split into the light and heavy part. So we tautologically have the relation that since the dispersion function has to annihilate uh, the correlator, it has to, it equates the light part with the heavy part. 
And the beauty of the fact that the dispersive functional uh, suppresses double traces is the fact that now in mean field theory, the dispersive function will give us exactly zero because everything is a double trace. So as n is strictly infinity, you get zero, you get zero equal to zero. And, and so if we are working for large n and we, we focus on the leading over one over n square contribution, we are going to now find a, a relation that only involves the single trace physics. The single trace physics will, for example, appear in the single trace exchange of the stress tensor. That's proportional to the central charge of over one over n squared. And, and similarly, the, uh, it will appear in, uh, we will we'll also, also order one over n squared are the uh, correction to the double trace dimensions and double trace of peak coefficients, which can be extracted from the effective quartic couplings in my original effective action. And so we get a way to relate now those effective couplings, which are um, related in some, in some well understood way to this correction to the double trace um, data, to some heavy stuff that we don't know about, but with some cleverness, one can make sure that the functional is positive on the heavy stuff. And so lo and behold, we get a, some rule which although technically more involved, has pretty much the same flavor as the ones before. We have a set of uh, conditions on the, on the light data that can be expressed in terms of something which we, we don't know about, but which comes with definite stuff. And so, and so by playing this game systematically, one gets to construct a bunch of sum roots, which are the very close model analog of the sum roots that I had earlier. So uh, before I had, ordinary CKU and now I have curly CKU and you can see the clear parallel. It turns out that the natural sum rules that come uh, from, from simple choice of kernels don't quite do the job because they, uh, they are give us something which is mirrored in the bulk in the, in the ADS notion of impact parameter. So you need to do some harmonic analysis in the bulk and play some sophisticated games to achieve this bulk focusing. But that can be done. And the moral of the story is that essentially when the dust clears and you control all the different subtle limits, one can almost directly up, up, uh, uplift the flat space bound to ADS bound, where of course powers of, of, of big M are replaced now by inverse powers of the gap. Okay, so... Uh, one of the promises of this game is that given that the CFT story is rigorous, can we uh, possibly uh, derive a better version of the act as matrix boost of actions by taking the limit more carefully? I don't have much more to say than just this basic uh, slogan. At the, in the CFT side, the reg bound is the rigorous consequence of unitarity. And so in particular, reg boundance holds with intercept more, greater, smaller or equal than one. As I emphasize, we don't strictly need this reg behavior uh, in momentum space. We need something weaker. But nevertheless, there's an interesting circle of ideas here in trying to see how, if one could carefully take the ADS, the first space limit of ADS, one could, uh, could make contact with these uh, various um, Logical conjecture. For example, there's a classical logical conjecture by this Indian group that uh, can be related to the chaos bound in ADS. Okay, so uh, I think I'm more or less perfectly in time because I started two minutes late. Uh, so that's my summary. So clearly, this is just the beginning. Um, I mean, I would say that the recent papers by our friends where they do. Um, Graviton scattering is already, you know, a little bit more than the beginning. Uh, but here there's a, there's a program that takes physically very similar in flat space on ADS. Technically, it's quite different, where you when one can use very general principles to put bounds on effective field theory that contains gravity. Uh, the CFT story is rigorous. The, the flat space story. Not quite, but nevertheless, the assumptions are rather, are rather, I would say, are rather conservative. And as a string theorist, you, you're, you're 
supposed to be that gravity is not this mysterious, you know, Pandora box. Gravity is rather conventional physics. And uh, here is a few directions uh, that are, some of them are obvious, various generalizations, multiple correlators, endpoint functions. Of course, it would be wonderful if one could find as the bounds become so more sophisticated, interesting theories saturate them. And needless to say, I have now answered the deep questions I started with at the beginning. Right, so in particular, uh, these questions about, for example, ideas separated, uh, sorry, scale separated ideas back here. Um, well, I have certainly haven't answered it. And well, I don't know what to think about it. Of course, I would hope that as we get more sophisticated, we could say something about it. Um, one needs to go beyond this. Um, the results of our paper. The results of our paper are a rather straightforward uplift to a yes of the flat space bound. That's not going to do it. So you have to hope that there are intrinsically stronger bounds in a yes than there are in flat space. If that's the case, then you could need hope to uh, to to say something about uh, scale separation. For example, a notorious question that Eric and I have been discussing for a while is: Okay, let's let's take a simple target. Maximally super gravity, maximal ideas super gravity, n equals eight ideas five super gravity. So, I think uh, we are we all believe that that's in the swamp plan. You need the infinite tower of Kaluza climb modes from the phi sphere to make sense with quantum mechanically, and it would be wonderful to have a rigorous bootstrap argument that that's indeed the case. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So are there um, further questions for Leonardo? Let me ask a question until people think of something. Um, you're using an action which you take as a classical action and then you do perturbation theory. The question is, in principle, this could have been the full effective action, provided, of course, that loop corrections would give um, similar contributions and there would be no infrared divergences. Now, is it possible to do this in some dimension? I, I, didn't, I didn't follow this. So I, I'm just doing effective field theory, right? So I'm, if, I'm assuming that I, I know the degrees of freedom in the infrared. Right. And then but I you, just tried the most Wilsonian. general. You're doing Wilsonian effective field theory. Yes, yes. The question is whether you could do normal effective action in which uh, you have integrated out even the master's degrees of freedom. And this is, if you wish, the effective action for the uh, classical fields. Of course, to do that, that, need... that, that, I don't know, you could try, but that is going to be problematic with respect to analyticity, right? So what's, what's good about the Wilsonian action is that it has. You know, as you know, you know, there's going to be all sorts of infrared issues in integrating out the one PI action and the Wilson action are notoriously different objects. And so the Wilsonian action, I would say, has this, this nice analyticity properties. If all, your, if all your fields were massive, of course, you would now not have any trouble, right? Of course, the problem is massless. Of course, we are trying to do quantum, we are trying to do gravity, where for right. sure there's a massless guy. <laughs> Okay, other questions? Actually, I may have a question related to what you asked, Elias, because I, I thought you could consider actually the 1PI effective action, but, but by expanding slightly away from the S equals zero uh, uh, point and getting to some intermediate scale and that they were working on this that could put some bound on the effective coupling, isn't it? Or am I misleading? By using the fact uh, that the 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 the, the, the sorry, why, is there any advantage? I mean, first of all, maybe, but what what would be the advantage? Well, the advantage is that you actually 
talk about the, the, the quantum amplitude. I'm not sure then I, I, if I understand that the, the Wilsonian amplitude in gravity has to satisfy any unitarity bound. It's the quantum amplitude that is of interest. So for example, when, when no, you- No, 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 no. I, I, perhaps I, I let, let me say this again. M is the full quantum amplitude. M is the full quantum amplitude. I'm just evaluating no, it's, it. It's an approximation it. to it at small, at weak coupling, right? It's an approximation. So let's forget about weak coupling for a second. What is the philosophy here? We have the full quantum amplitude that obeys a variety of analyticity and unitarity assumption. That is the full quantum amplitude. Then we are going to evaluate to, uh, this split, this argument about relating um, the um, this very general argument here is valid for the full quantum amplitude. No assumption about anything is being made in, in saying that this contour should vanish. I mean, uh, under my axioms, of course, right? Under my axiom, I can relate this red arc, this arc of the red region to the, to the high energy cuts in full generality. If you're willing to, to take the integral of the red arc as your physical low energy data, then there's nothing more to say. This, this, the, the, you will have certain moments of the quantum amplitude. Th those, are, those will define your low energy parameters by definition. And you will relate them to, you will, you will, you will derive under these assumptions, some rig rigorous inequalities for them. Now, if you want to relate these moments of the amplitude to coefficients in effective action, then you have some matching to do. And the matching is easiest to do at three level. It's also a very phys interesting physical uh, problem to understand what happens to weakly coupled theories of gravity. After all, gravity in the real world is truly very weakly coupled. And, and so that's all that has been said here, that the matching involves an approximation of the low energy effective field theory at three level. Mm. But be my guest and include loops. No, no, yeah. But yeah. Do if you want to do a more sophisticated map, go ahead. It's going to be a tiny correction to what I'm telling you here. And so how do you know that gravity is weakly coupled? I'm surprised that you're saying that. Well, the weakly coupled, well, it's weakly coupled at our energies, right? I mean, but are you using the fact that the gravity is weakly coupled at the string scale, for example, whatever yes. it is? Yes, so that, that is... That but is that we don't know. Well, in string theory, that's... Well... <laughs> At weak string coupling, it's true, Slava. A weak is coupling yeah. is true. Yeah, but why, but why so much focus on weakly coupled quantum gray? I mean, it's, it's it much more interesting things. to consider some framework which would include all cases. Why should we focus on maybe, this particular core? Maybe. Well, one, I, I don't have a... Well, first of all, because it's very hard to <laughs> make progress in full generality. Um, and and I guess I if, you, if, if you put I don't know. parameters... I would say the, indication, the indications from, from experiment is that this weak coupling is certainly correct, you know, for quite high energy, you know, then eventually we will encounter strong coupling. But I would say everything we, we have learned in particle physics is weakly coupled so far. Yeah, but in string theory, we may reach Planck uh, length before you reach string length. That's a question. No, I mean. that you can never do. That, that you can, can never certainly do. never. That you can certainly never do. You could you could imagine exotic situation where they're they're of the same order, but certainly not or roughly of the same order, but certainly not. Planck length is certainly always higher than the than the string length. Uh, by duality, nice. okay, but uh, roughly what? No, this has nothing to do with duality. It has to do with weak coupling. Yes, the weak coupling. Yeah, but why weak coupling? <laughs> that's because the, that's the only one you can do. However. If it's, one could I don't know. The so full true, there were some function. papers. There were some papers on quantum gravity which did not assume weak coupling. I mean, there was for some reason much less work on S matrix for but again. I, I insist. There, I insist. There are papers on weak coupling. I insist. That, papers on strong coupling. I insist that if you want to uh, parameterize the low energy data by taking moments of these arcs, as our friend Ricardo, for example, advocates then that's fine. But uh, I, that's something also that I'm confused. So in much of your 
in much of your talk, you never mentioned any action. You just like discuss some bounds on coefficients which appeared in the. Well, that's just for. That's totally for, fine with me. That's this for framework is equally applicable uh, independently of, of the fact whether your theory is weakly or strongly coupled at the cutoff scale, right? The very general framework is. However, if you want to relate this to, well, okay, to relate Maybe. to what. <laughs> It's an experimental to something, to something, tan to something tangible. <laughs> if I read it to something tangible, like, like uh, you know, some higher some uh, coefficients of of uh, of uh, irrelevant terms in your effective action, that I would call it something tangible. Then you need your cup with cup. But yes, I'm in principle you could you could try to do something less more. But more is this a must to do this next step? Or? It's not a must. One thing that. I mean, I gave this talk about gravity because I really wanted to give a different talk. And I, and in fact, I told Francesco that perhaps you shouldn't record this talk and then perhaps I gave a different talk, but then I wasn't ready for it. What I really want to do with this program is pi on physics, uh, a large n. And then um, that gives you a perfectly, um, physical justification for weak coupling. It's just large n. Pi on to pi on scattering is suppressed by powers of n. And so a large n, we are, um, you know, we expect, uh, I mean, first of all, we know in QCD, well, I mean, we on the very general assumption, QCD is a theory of, of stable resonances, whose width is, is, is some inverse power of n. And, and, then, uh, and then we are precise in this weak coupling framework. We are, in fact, that's of course what motivated Venetian amplitude in the first place. We're gonna have only have poles of these towers of massive resonances. And so there's a perfectly rigorous program of finding uh, of bounds on, on the space of, um, you know, in some sense, large n 